Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Piers Ridiard. I am the CEO of Radix and I am joined today by the Chief Product Officer of Radix, Matthew Hine. Uh, today we're going to be following on from the first um, of a, videos that, a video that we've been doing. This is the second part of a four-part series uh, and it's following along a blog uh, a series of blog posts that Matt has been writing on our blog um, to just discuss a bit about sort of what lays the foundation for Scripto uh, and for and and for the uh, Alexandria release that's coming at the end of this year, and just help people understand sort of the, the philosophy and the and the build approach we've taken to coming to what we think is something pretty game changing. So the second uh, one in the um, series is Radix Engine V2, an asset oriented smart contract environment. Mm -hmm. So, Matt, what are we going to be talking about today? Yeah, so uh, you know, Scripto is getting a lot of a lot of the excitement. It's where we've been talking about how it's a new asset oriented smart contract language. It changes the approach from how it's typically done in Solidity and other smart contract languages, but. Before we get to the language itself, I think it's really important for people to understand what lies beneath the language, because really that's sort of the, the more important aspect that defines the developer's experience. Basically, it sets the boundaries on what the developer is able to do and what's easy and what's hard and what's possible. So Radix Engine V2 is that for us entirely. In fact, Radix Engine in general is that for us. That's our application layer, if you will. Um, it's sort of analogous to on Ethereum, if you've heard of the Ethereum virtual machine or the EVM, it's kind of the analogous thing there. So even though Solidity is the language that most people use to program smart contracts today, the EVM is what makes Solidity possible in a way. So we want to talk about Radix Engine because it's got some really interesting features. Awesome. Okay. Well, then let's let's start by, I suppose, talking a little bit about what the Ethereum approach is. And so that people can, because I think a lot of people just go sort of go, oh, it's it, there's DeFi and there's a program that defines DeFi and that's probably like a single program, uh, like Uniswap must be a single program or like Aave must be a single program. Um, and, and I think that it's really interesting to start going under the hood and, and really de deconstruct what's happening on top of these public ledgers to understand why it becomes so complicated. So if you mm -hmm. could just start off with that, that'd be great. Yeah, it is quite interesting. Uh, you know, I think I think a lot of this comes from you talk about the Ethereum world computer, which is you know, it's a great concept. I love that phrase, the world computer. It's very evocative, and so it comes with a lot of assumptions. People go like, "Oh, cool, okay, there's this decentralized ledger, and I can just run stuff on it." And so, you know, obviously, obviously, that's all you need. Once you have that, anything is possible, and so you can go from there. But there are actually some very particular choices that were made in the EVM that strongly influence how you, how you go about doing things there. So if you think, if you want to describe what the EVM environment looks like, it, you, you can start by thinking of it as sort of this shared computing environment. It's kind of like a main, big mainframe computer from the, from the 70s. You know, you load programs onto this thing and all those programs are kind of running on the same computer. So that part of it is, is totally accurate. It's the world computer. But if you just have these little individual programs running alone, that's not very useful. And that's where you start with a smart contract. Basically, the idea of a smart contract is you can load a piece of code into this shared environment, and it's got its own little environment. It's got its own data. It's got its, you know, it can keep its own variables. And when, and when you call that, that program, then it will update its internal state to something new. So it's like, okay, now the variables are a little bit different. So you can imagine smart contracts as all these little, these little uh, separate programs that are running in this environment. Um, right. And and for better or worse, the way I think of it is like, it, it didn't really click for me until I was like, oh, it's not many computers running on the network. It's uh, many different computers running on the network. It's all the computers essentially running the same computer on the network. Mm -hmm. So Ethereum isn't many computers. It's one computer that is copied many times and everyone is just agreeing on what the state of that that single computer is. And if you right. think of a computer, you, you know that your computer at home can run multiple programs. So you could have Word open, you could have Excel open, and you can copy things between Word and Excel. Uh, and then you extend this out to a server, which is like where it starts to become a bit more esoteric and more techy because a lot of people don't understand this idea of like many sessions, user mm -hmm. sessions on the same server, but like it's, it, it's, it, it's getting towards the same principal idea. It's a single computer or a single server. Everyone's running the same execution of everything. And your, com your computer program 
or, or your smart contract is essentially a little thing running in isolation on top of that server. Right. Your piece of code, from its point of view, it's got its own little world and it can't see outside of that world. It's doing its own thing. But obviously, if that's all there was to it, there would, you wouldn't be, DeFi wouldn't work. You wouldn't, it's like, well, you know, we, we have this notion of like, well, you know, these things need to be interact with each other. And so the, the other critical feature that the EVM invented was this idea of basically communication between these individual little machines. Um, and so this is when you hear people talking about method calls and the method is sort of like the, it's the little external port that your little thing offers to the world. So this is something where if you're creating a transaction, you can interact with a method or if you're a different program on the environment, you can also interact with methods of, of other smart contracts. And basically what that means is passing a message to it. You can say, you can send a message to it and say like, okay, your method accepts like this string and this, this number and it will do something something in its little environment. And it'll, it might send a message back to me and I might do something in my little environment as a response to that. So you can kind of think, I like to make this this kind of cute metaphor of, of a little busy city. If you imagine the, the Ethereum environment is the city and you have these individual buildings, these individual businesses that are built in that city. If they can't talk to each other, they can't really do business together. So, okay, great. So Ethereum offers a communications grid. There's a telephone grid there. So now if I'm in one, if I'm my, my business, I can call up the business next door and say, hey, I want to buy something or I want to sell something. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to do this over in my site. But that's really the kind of the extent of how Ethereum, the EVM works. And so anything you want to build on Ethereum fits into that model. Um, so everything, everything DeFi is just messages. Right. Everything, every, everything you see running on Ethereum today for DeFi, like absolutely everything from really complex swapping and loan, lending platforms all the way down to, and I'll talk about this, all the way down to just a token is always an individual little program that's just sending messages between other programs. And right, so, which interestingly, that that was that's what an ERC twenty is, right? Mm -hmm. An ERC twenty is just a definition of a of a of methods that can be called and expected responses. Is that it's not even it's not even a definition of a contract. It's just saying these are the methods that we the the standard way in which you can talk to this contract and what you should expect to be able to do when in conversation with this contract. Right. Exactly. In fact this is a really good place to start to understand what this means to be to be building smart contracts in the environment. There's a there was the there were these commercials, you're, you're not an American, but if you're an American, there were these commercials they ran in, on television, like every evening in the, like the 70s and 80s, they ran these little, these little public service messages before the news. It says, it's 10 p.m., do you know where your children are? And it was sort of this, <laughs> this thing. So like, to me, like, I, I always want to ask this question for people on Ethereum. It's like, it's 10 p.m., do you know where your tokens are? Because it's not what you think. It's, it, it's interesting that like, if you've got MetaMask, you've got a wallet, you, and you pull it up, it's like, okay, you've got your list of tokens in there. But you might have noticed that actually, if you're using kind of an unusual token, or in, in some wallets, it's any token, you had to specifically add that token as something that your wallet pays attention to. It's sort of like, you know, right. your friend sent you some USDC, and you go, oh, okay, I had to add USDC to my wallet or some, you know, right. meme, meme token that you got. Why did you have to do that? Why? It's like, if it's in this wallet, why can't the wallet just see that it's in there? Well, it's because it's not actually in there. The, the idea is that because everything has to be implemented, these, these separate little smart contracts, every single token on Ethereum is its own little smart contract. And like you said, it's got its own middle methods that sort of simulates it. It operates kind of like a bank's ledger, to be honest, like a bank sort of it says, if you know, money in a bank typically is basically just entries in a bunch of ledgers that says, OK, I know how much Alice has. I know how much Bob says I know how much Charlie has. And so. What happens on Ethereum is every single token is maintaining its own little ledger of who right. owns what. So it's implementing like not just sort of saying, yeah, this is what I want my token to do. It's implementing the entire concept of a token from scratch every time you deploy one of these things. Right. So if you want to say like, hey, how many tokens do I own? What your wallet has to do is, is go out and talk to every individual token smart contract and say, hey, here's my key. Here's my address. Do you have any tokens for this address? And then the contract says, "Yeah, according to my balance sheet, I've got you've got twenty three of those tokens." Then you go to the next one. Yeah, yeah, you've got fourteen of this token. And so then your wallet can build up this list of balances. But there isn't really there's no notion on Ethereum of like my account holds these tokens. Other than right. I'll put the little asterisk there. Other than the Ethereum token itself, which is kind of funny. Like the Ethereum token is special, and you actually hold those. But every other third party token that people create is just implemented over and over again in these individual smart contracts. So it's kind of weird to begin with. This leads to some odd things with like, I forget if we talked about this last time with Uniswap. I think we did that like, if you're swapping on Uniswap, 
the first thing you have to do, and people have seen, if you use, you use Uniswap, you're, you're familiar right. with this. You have to give permission to them to say, yes, I want to trade this token. And it's like, right. why did you do that? Well, what you're doing is you're saying, in order to make this system work, you have to give the Uniswap contract permission to kind of go to your bank account on your behalf and say, okay, I'm going to pull some of his tokens out so I can do this swap and then and then push the other tokens the other way. So it's kind of weird. It's sort of, it's in right. some ways, it's more like the banking system. than a, you've, It doesn't feel like DeFi, even though it is. But it's also terrifying when I like when I yeah. sort of really understood it. I was like, oh, so because I, I, I actually asked you the question. I was like, yeah, but I just do it for the amount of tokens I want to send. And you're like, no. Yeah. So like what's actually happening is I've got some USDC. Mm. Right. And I in, and the USDC is its own little smart contract that defines what a USDC is. And it keeps its own ledger of balances. And one of the balances is mine against my my wallet address and so it let will let me with with my public key come and 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 my signature come and say oh i'd like to transfer some tokens to matt and what i'm actually doing is just telling that smart contract to update the balance it holds of matt to 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 uh to to his balance right and if he doesn't have you yet then adding you to the, his ledger inside that little smart contract and then adding you up however yeah. DeFi comes along and goes, well, what we need is not person-to-person interaction, right. but but dap-to-dap interaction. So now what I do is I go to Uniswap and I'm like, I'd like to swap USDC for, uh, let's say I want to swap it for rats, right? right? For and you're EXR. sending a message. You send a message around a swap that say like, it's like, you know, swap request, the tokens that you want, and like the number of tokens that you would like to do. And you just pass right. that as a message to it. Right. But now Uniswap goes, okay, well... For me to do that, I have to know that I'm going to get the USDC guaranteed Mm -hmm. uh, and that I can swap it for EXRD at the rate that you want, the slippage you want. But, you know, things can happen in between. Things can happen as a result of, you know, someone front running on the slippage changes or whatever. So I have some I have some I have some boundaries for which this transaction is now conditional. So what I don't want to do is end up with your USDC if I can't deliver you your EXRD. Right. So what I'm going to ask you is I'm going to go, hey, Piers, can you give me Uniswap contract permission, carte blanche forever to update your balance on the USDC contract? Right. It's basically like it's like giving your giving the password of your bank account to another bank or right. or another application. It's like you can you can log into it. I trust that you're going to do the right thing and right. and you're going to with my balances. Yeah, and that's the only way of doing it because, like you said, you could there is the concept of like I could send USDC to the Uniswap smart contract and it can hold that. It has its own address. It can hold it just like anything else. But if you want to do this atomically, which every all DeFi is like, I want to do all this in one transaction. There's no notion of like, I'm sending you these tokens from this smart contract as long as you do this swap that I want. Like the only way of doing it is just going to Uniswap and saying, here's what I want to have happen and giving Uniswap permission to do it on your behalf, to pull the tokens and then it has the permission to send tokens to you because it's their tokens. So it's kind of strange. Like you start building up this picture of like how things like Uniswap actually work. And you find that you get this because of you have, you're, you're doing everything through this messaging between lots of these little smart contracts. You just start building up like layers and layers of complexity, like things that you thought would be conceptually simple end up being, you know, there, there's a diagram in the, in the document that you can take or in the, uh, the blog post that shows like just that Uniswap smart contract call of saying like, I want to swap USDC for whatever other token is this like kind of spider's web of messages that get passed between that and multiple other right. smart contracts and getting statuses back and recording local caches to make sure that it, it knows what the correct status of this other smart contract is because it needs to do some calculations based on that. So it becomes this very complicated thing. And that's for, you know, a swap should basically be about the simplest possible thing in DeFi. Token A for token B. How, how much easier can it be? And right. then if you think about more complex things, you got like lending platforms and all these sorts of things and, you know, options and futures and derivatives. Like now it starts getting, building anything like, oh, and then on top of that, let's say you want to compose between these things where you say, well, what I want to do is build a, a smart contract where I'm going to take a flash loan over here so I can take advantage right. of an arbitrage opportunity over here. And that whole thing yeah. resolves at once. Imagine the enormous amount of messaging complexity that goes into that. And that is... The crux of why it's so difficult to avoid exploits in DeFi, because right. if you're the programmer that has to build and manage all those those 
those messages, it just every one of those messages becomes another edge case you deal with. It's like, well, I got right. this message, but this one wasn't in a format that I expected. And oops, okay, I got to check that to make sure I don't see something silly there. It just becomes opportunities for you thinking something happened when it didn't, or you know, an edge case you didn't expect. Right, and there's no such thing as like one-time permissions or like oh you've know you've got this or, or it's very difficult to implement that kind of thing yeah, and then if, the, if you wanted to have the notion of one-time permissions it would have to be implemented in every single token smart contract separately which is like okay right. well do we want to do a standard for that and now we've got to migrate all our smart contracts to update to that new standard and yeah right and the, and and this is the other thing that i thought was so interesting about flash loans is that uh, every single every single smart contract platform every single uh sorry every single decentralized finance application like Aave and compound and uniswap um all implement uh their interfaces for their particular application so you've got the erc20 standard mm -hmm. but then you've got the DeFi sort of ecosystem and they've all sort of decided their own interfaces and they're all characterizations of what their application does and so actually, yes, you can do flash loans as a concept, but in, re re in reality, to actually implement the flash loan, you often have to then implement your own smart contract, a router smart contract that will right. route the messages that you want in an atomic way. You can't just go, oh, I would like, hey, Uniswap, I'd like to compose you with uh, Aave. You've actually got to write a separate smart contract for that. And there's a bunch of people who do, do that. And like m majority of that is arbitrages. Mm -hmm. um, but like... I think that people don't realize quite how complicated getting these applications to talk to each other because there is no shared understanding of what an asset is. There is no shared understanding of what what it means to make a financial transaction. It's just messages, and those messages are kind of like, well, whatever you want it to be. Right. Yeah, and the and the uh, this even applies for like if you talk about these routers and wanting to interact with different things, even just. Something that you would think is like, well, okay, at the very least, you can just sort of assume the ERC-20 standard. Like, okay, I can support ERC-20 tokens and I can talk to any ERC-20 token. But the problem is that even then, you don't really know what's going inside. Like, ERC-20 is basically just saying, here's a description of the methods. An ERC-20 contract should should know how to do a send, to check a balance, you know, basic things like that. But the logic inside of that, you don't have access to that internal logic. And so... If you are, if you're saying, well, I want to build a router or a DeFi project that's going to interact with the ERC-20 contracts, you need to carefully do your own checks to make sure that that ERC-20 contract is behaving the way you expect it. Because you could send a message to it to say, hey, I want to do a send from A to B. But if that contract decided to say, well, actually, when I get that message, I'm just going to send that to C instead, you know, I'm just... Yeah. Or, you know, do something funny or there's just a bug in there or something they didn't expect. Right. Like the onus is on you as the as the the consumer of that token to make sure that you don't allow anything you don't want. So now right. even something as simple as just interacting with an arbitrary set of tokens of the platform becomes this huge developer burden. Right. And it's like it's like Uniswap. Um, you know, the 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 you interact if you want to do a swap, you interact with the LP. ERC twenty contract, mm -hmm. but that's because this is is because and like if you think about that for just a second, that kind of it blows your mind. It's like, well, I would kind of be expecting to, I would expect to be interacting with a pool, but right. I'm not. I'm interacting with, I'm interacting with this this contract which issues LP tokens. And is there also the method by which I do the swap? It's my entry into the into the, the the system, but where the assets are actually held is elsewhere. And it's so it's just it, it it's actually this Byzantine system. And like people often hold up Uniswap as being a fantastically in uh, a fantastically oh, yeah. engineered system, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and and so this whole like concept of what an what an ERC to what a token is is blown apart because a token isn't a thing. A token is just actually just a, a way of describing what you want from a contract. Mm -hmm. If you were looking at the ERC-20 standard and, and then all of this engineering happens in the background that not just to optimize for, um, for building securely on Ethereum and making sure the right permissions are in the right place, but also the secondary aspect of optimizing for gas, which, you know, a lot of people talk about, Uniswap v3 being like solidity black magic because they did some things where they just right. worked out a way of hacking solidity to make it more gas efficient because it's really gas inefficient in how it does its executions right. and so they've done they've done these like very clever things 
But if you look at it, the code is not readable in the slightest. Like, and you have no idea what's going on. You're like, is, what is this contract doing? I, I don't understand because it's so well optimized for a system that is bad in the first place, that has no concept of what assets are. And so like this idea that DeFi developers can even build on each other's innovations is actually not really true because I can't just go into the Uniswap V3 contract and go, I like this bit of it. That's a clever way of doing this thing right. because it's highly optimized code mm -hmm. for a really esoteric language on a platform that just doesn't really understand what assets are and has to define them from scratch every, sing every single example. Just think about Uniswap and how many smart contracts that have redefined what an asset is it is talking to and it kind of starts to blow your mind yeah so you can see how the thing we talked about last time was like if you wanted to build the the ideal computing platform the ideal developer experience for DeFi, it would be easy safe reusable and composable mm -hmm. and you can see how those four things are all made worse by the way the evm is structured like it it's really difficult to even though it's you know the, even though solidity is based in javascript and you can pick it up in an afternoon actually getting to uniswap level quality requires all of this this deep sort of platform optimization to work around how the, the platform works and spending a lot of time understanding how to do that correctly and how to interact with other things. Um, and then, you know, the safety and all the reuse to be composed, this is pretty obvious from what we've been talking about. So, so then the question is, how do we solve that problem? Like it's the, you, you started with something that feels pretty elemental. It's like, okay, shared computing environment, separate programs, they can talk to each other. What else can you do? Um, and so this is something this goes back, you know, years at Radix, really kind of thinking about what does the development environment want to look like. And one of the, the key insights that Radix had was that that assets and by assets, I mean, you know, tokens is the most common thing, but it's really kind of a more general purpose thing. It's like the, this idea of you have this unique thing, which has a, has, a, has a physical existence. So this could be a token, but you could also imagine things like authorization, identity, and all these sorts of things. But the idea that assets are what DeFi, it's basically, when I say DeFi, I mean, it's really kind of what public ledgers are about. Like, it's no, mis it's no accident that when, when Satoshi, Satoshi Nakamoto launched Bitcoin, Bitcoin wasn't a decentralized platform to timestamp transactions it was, or to, you know, to do like, you know, verify that this thing happened at this point in time. It's like, it was a coin because mm -hmm. that's what these things are really good. You can do digital cash for the first time. And right. everything, I would argue that basically everything great that's been built on decentralized ledgers since then has been all wrapped around the concept of assets of different type. Um, right. So, you know, when we say objects DeFi, we mean it quite... Objects, digital objects with permanence. Yeah, digital objects right. with permanence. I mean, really... So, like, an NFT is a digital object with permanence. A, a USDC, a Bitcoin, any of these are just... you. you once they're created, you expect them to behave in a certain way Right. And so once you have the possibility of having a digital object that has permanence, then kind of immediately there's the, the notion of that can have value because that's sort of the prerequisite for anything having value. And so that's why we say that, you know, we say that we're the, a platform for DeFi. This is what we mean by DeFi. This is what we mean by finance is the fact that finance is basically it's, it's about the management of things that have value and making sure that those things can move easily and can interact with each other. You know, efficient allocation of capital and all these sorts of things that come out of that are basically it's, you know, it's, Finance is an extremely broad thing. It isn't just, it isn't just you know options and derivatives and trading. It goes down to like NFTs, for example. NFTs are 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 peak finance, in my opinion. It's the idea that you have you have this this unique thing which an individual can own and it can develop develop value. And so you immediately, as soon as NFTs happen, you saw these really. There's a I forget what the name of the project was, but there's this cool thing that's basically like you can use NFTs as collateral to issue a synthetic asset that you can do other things with. Like once something has value, you it can't help but interact with the rest of finance. And so it's a very broad term. So so how do we enable that? If that's what decentralized ledgers are about, is there something we can add to the the, the EVMs, add to the to the the computing environment that we have that really cuts to the key to that key use case that the, the, the like focuses on making that as easy and safe as possible. And so 
the the conclusion we came to is that assets needed to be a first class feature of the platform. So if you go back to our little city metaphor, it's like, okay, we've got our little city, they've got your separate little businesses that are running, they, they can talk to each other. Great. We keep that. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But what we need to add is a little shipping service. We need we need the basically the idea of I need to be able to actually move physical things between buildings. This is, you know, it's kind of obvious if you think about it in terms of businesses. Businesses don't just talk to each other. They ship things around. They they change ownership of things. And those things need to have rules about who can accept those things and where they can go and how many of them are. It's sort of the 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 the, the generalized rules of of a of an object with digital permanence that you're talking about, an asset. So Radix Engine is the first um, the first development environment that, that that institutes assets as a first class feature. We actually provide that at the platform level. We don't push this up to the developer layer and say, well, you got to re-implement that concept over and over and over again. We say the platform, when you're writing code on this environment, you just have access to that. You can just say, hey, I want an asset. I want the asset to have these features. And then later on, you can say, okay, I want this asset to move from here to here. I want to send this asset to here. So this, you know, if you, if you kind of cut to the end of this, if you imagine building something like Uniswap, this now allows Uniswap, it allows that code to say that the, the, the code you write can directly say the thing you would expect it to say. You can say, you can say if I receive token A, I will then do a calculation and I will send back token B. You need to be able to speak in those kinds of terms rather than, well, okay, I'm going to get permission to this and I'm going to talk to this smart contract to do this thing. And the result kind of looks like swapping A for B. You just need to be able to write logic that says, I want to accept A and I want to send this much B back. So that means you need to have that as a feature of the platform. So we, so even this is, this actually really does go back, you know, as, as everyone knows, we've, we've launched uh, the Olympia version of our mainnet and uh, Olympia includes Radix Engine V1. Hmm. Radix Engine V1 already has this this notion implemented in it, which is you know I don't think many people even know this. There was, there was actually there was one guy in Discord I saw the other day that was it blew my mind. It was awesome. He actually took apart Radix Engine V1 and he drew the finite state machine diagram. He like mapped it out and it was like, yep, that's exactly what it is. That's the important thing. That was the important. That was the important piece of implementing this idea of assets. And this is we, right. we've been talking about the finite state machine approach. And people are like, "Well, what do you right. mean by that? Does this mean the right. code is going to be weird to write?" No, no. The idea is that the finite state machine is this way of defining asset rules. The platform says assets have kind of a limited set of things. An asset can be here or it can be here. If you're going to move an asset from here to here, there has to be permissions. Like someone has to have the the rights to move it from here to here. So all of those basic rules of how physical things should be operate, you can encode those things as a finite state machine. And what that means is that anything you do that is very very reliable. So when we talk about you know this is the kind of thing you use for nuclear power stations, it's like you want to know all of the states in which the system can be to make sure that a bad condition is never possible. So Radix Engine implements assets in that way. You say assets are a core feature of the platform implemented through a finite state machine. And so when you're issuing a token on on the Olympia mainnet today, you notice that you can just go through API. You can make an API request say, hey, I want a token that has these features and it hands you back a token. You're done. You didn't have to write a smart contract for it. Right. So this, it's, it's it's deeper than that, right? Like, it's, yeah. It's, it, I think I think there's a really important like in the early in the early days where we were sort of starting the process of working out our thinking on this. We we would we, we started off by talking about constraint machines, right? Mm -hmm, right. We were like, look, what is what is a public ledger? It is a it is a it is not just declaring what a thing is. It is also declaring what a thing is not or cannot do. Yeah. And if you look at and if you look at like most production, and, and, and that code, goes back to Bitcoin again. Like again, people under right. under they don't misunderstand the brilliance of Bitcoin. It was like Bitcoin was this way of of a decentralized network running and like and have that be not controlling it but being able to manage things. But on top of that, it said there is this notion of a coin, and a coin is defined by the fact that. Only one person can own it at a time and that there are rules associated with how it can move between people. If you don't have both of those things, you can't have Bitcoin. You can't have digital cash. Right. And so the, the, the system of like universally enforced constraints on top of a shared ledger was, 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 is revolutionary, I think. But 
if you if you haven't ever built a production development system before, a lot of people don't realize that the majority of the code isn't actually defining what the system does. It's defining how it gets out of error states. Like right. or it, it, you it can't do that. Identifying no, you, it. Ca- you yeah. can't do that. You don't have permission to do that. No, that's an error. No, that's incorrectly formed. It's malformed. This is this is what we're returning. Right. And error handling is is it in and itself is huge like uh, combination of um, computer science methodology uh, and developer approach and um, sort of research and all this kind of stuff. Like error handling is like every single level of computing. Error handling forms the backbone of what makes computing usable. Mm-hmm. Um, like error handling is what makes computer like memory work. It's what makes you know freaking phone cameras work and all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And what you get, what we kind of realized is go, well, well, instead of keeping the constraint machine to us, like to just our token, to just to just the things that we just to just the things that we want to strongly enforce, like consensus. Mm -hmm. What if we make the what if we generalize the concept of a constraint machine so that you can define a narrow a, a set of constraints for a thing? Right. That allows you to then go, well, I know that I'm guaranteed that it's going to behave in a certain way because those constraints are are, are are given by the ledger, not that I have to program them, that I have to think about them. Like you right. do with an ERC-20. If you look at an ERC-20, you are defining the constraints of what defines a token in the first place. Mm-hmm. Whereas with the Radix engine, the Radix engine goes, no, we we understand this idea of what object permanence means and like intuitively that's something that someone just instantly understands but from a technical point of view from a digital point of view it's really really difficult to define fully Mm -hmm. but we take that away we go look instead of instead of you having to work out what you mean by object permanence and that ends up digital object permanence which ends up being just what a digital asset is we go here's a set of tools to allow you to define things with given object permanence so that you don't have to worry about it mm-hmm. but so that also the ledger no longer is just messages the ledger intu- actually understands at a code at a programming level at a language level what you mean by a token? Oh, I declare that I want to take this token from here to here. And the and the constraint machine, the Radix engine, is enforcing that that is a token that can only exist in one place. It can only be owned by one person or one smart contract. And mm-hmm. that it, when it moves, that it moves according to a set of very strongly enforced constraints right. that are very difficult to break, or in fact, impossible to break unless you break consensus. Right, exactly. And so that gets to the, the transition from Radix engine V1 to 2, where... Radix Engine V1 on Olympia, we essentially built that tool kind of for ourselves. We were like, look, we, you know, we knew for sure that that being able to issue a token was just a core feature. Like this is this is like to, to be a platform that has any meaning at all, users need to be able to issue their own tokens. They're not, there's not going to be one token. But rather than pushing that responsibility to the developer, we said, well, okay, we're going to build this this constraint machine, this Radix Engine, which is going to 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 provide the notion of a token and the cool thing about that was that we we needed that notion for the platform token itself the utility token of the of the radix network xrd it needs to have object permanence and these sorts of things and this is where the ethereum token actually does that it's like a feature of the ethereum platform that the ethereum token needs to have these rules but oddly you know ethereum didn't generalize it and we did the, the what we said is like the cool thing is with radix engine when we implemented the xrd token well, all we had to do is just say like, okay, and anyone else can do that too. The implementation of XRD and any other token on the Radix network is exactly the same. They, they, they're transacted in the same way. The same rules are applied to them. They're, they're treated both at the same first class level. So then moving to Radix Engine V2, what we need to do is, is offer that to the external developer that allow the, the, an individual developer to get access programmatically to that and to be able to basically, you know, we don't have a computing environment with with Olympia. You know, there's no way of loading your own code into the shared environment. All you can do is sort of interact with things that are there. With with Babylon, when we introduce Scripto onto the public network and Radix Engine V2 onto the public network, now you have basically the same kind of computing environment that you have with the EVM. You can load in your own contracts, your your own code. Those codes can it can communicate with other pieces of code, but you have 
that any code you write has access at a lower level to this notion of assets. You don't have to re-implement that. You don't have to write special code around making sure that's done correctly of error handling, all these sorts of things. You can write code that just uses that as a first class feature. And that is really important because it, it kills two birds with one stone. And this is something that I think that, that we, we want to get across to people because as we've been talking about, you know, we've been talking about notionally about crypto is going to make it easier to build DeFi. And I think people, for good reason, their first assumption is, well, okay, they're like simplifying it. They're saying it's going to be kind of a toy language that does these few DeFi things really well, but eh, you, you, would, it, it's, it's, you can't do other things with it. And it's actually the, very much the opposite of it. The idea is all the power that you had before in Ethereum is still there. There's nothing wrong with that. The issue was is that you weren't giving developers enough tools to be able to focus on the problem they care about. You were forcing them to build things they didn't that wasn't core to what they're trying to do. You were forcing them to re-implement the notion of assets and re-implement the notion of managing those assets and making sure all those things are done correctly. If we give those give that to the developer as a first class feature of the platform, you can still build code that's absolutely as powerful, absolutely as flexible as you could before. But now there's a bunch of code you don't have to write anymore. And there's a bunch of complexity that you don't have to compensate for, that you don't have to write special error handling around. And what that means is that your code gets gets easier to write and safer in the end because there's less to reason about. There are fewer edge cases you need to worry about, but without reducing your flexibility. You can write, in, in fact, in, you know, I would say that it actually opens up the possibility of way more flexibility and way more powerful applications because it means you can spend, more, like every time you introduce a feature, it means that it doesn't multiply this sort of complexity of like, well, if I do this, now I have to do a different sort of sets, sets of error checks in order to, in, to interact with all these different assets. Now adding a new feature just becomes okay i'm just writing the writing that new feature and i just assume that everything you know what's the the the, the asset management part of that is going to happen correctly because it can't do otherwise right right and i think that the the, the, the lovely analogy uh, that we sort of recently dis discussed mm. was this the, the game engine analogy yes. right like when before like back in the day when i was a lad um and uh, you know to be fair i never developed games but when people used to develop games one of the things that they had to do was write the physics engine of the game and that was a huge job you had to define how physics worked in your game and like you literally hired um people who had degrees in physics and phds in physics to work out how water would work and how you know how the the physics of um buildings would work and all of this kind of stuff and you still see actually people like pushing the physics engine like breakthroughs in physics engines as, as like a, a a key selling point of AAA games like i think mm. battlefield's most recent one was like hugely about this like everything is demol de demolishable mm -hmm. um but writing a physics engine and just writing what the rules of a game is, is really difficult because we as humans, we instantly understand what it is to live in a physical world. So we expect the virtual characters that are created that exist in the virtual world to mimic what it is to be in a physical world. But that's really difficult to write in code because code has no idea of what a wall is, mm -hmm. has no idea of what a floor is. And so if you don't define that a floor is impermeable by the, by the person, then the person will just fall through the floor or like if you don't define that the person is held together in a certain way then they'll just fall into bits and, and so and if you're a game designer this is really important because you want to be able to design your game around these notions of like okay in order for the user to get from point a to point b they have to pass through this door and they can't just walk through the wall and so if the physics right. is wrong it breaks the game Right, which is what a lot of speedwalkers do, right? They right. just find these like little hacks where they're like, oh, I can walk through the wall here and bypass an entire level of the game. Right. Um, and so game engines were a game changer for the gaming industry because it basically, yes, yeah, a lot of game changers, a lot of games, um, uh, because it basically said, hey, here's a way in which you, you can take physics for granted, that you can take the world for granted. But the game engine didn't say, well, you can only have, you know, gravity of normal gravity. It mm -hmm. said, well, you can change gravity if you want to. But we, are, we, we implement the concept of gravity, mm -hmm. including the parameters that can be changed around gravity. Um, and the notion that, like, you can't, that, you know, if you, if you have something that's physical, it can't go something, through something that's defined as a wall. And right. The but, then, but then you can add all of these conditions to it. You can say, well, unless the force is over this amount of, and then maybe it'll make a hole in it, only if it's this thick, but if it's any thicker, then it won't. All of this really complicated 
like logic that had to be done. Mm -hmm. The game engine just gave to the developer. And now the developer could go, well, I'll just focus on making my game the best game it can be. I don't need to worry about, I don't need to worry about the rules of a world, the rules of physics. It, it, it's given to me. It's right. there. Now I can just think about what I want the world to be. And that didn't reduce that didn't reduce the complexity of what you can build. It didn't sort of say, well, you can only build this kind of game. It's like, no, you can still build whatever you want. It's just relieved the burden of a lot of this stuff. And it allowed right. it allowed, you know, you could get, you know, um, you know, one developer, one artist, and one level designer to get together, pick up the Unreal Engine and launch a really high quality game, whereas that would have been right. utterly impossible without the game engine, because they would have spent ninety percent of their time trying to reimplement the physics they needed to be able to get to the game they actually wanted to build. Right. Right. And 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 that completely changed how like good games became and how and how universal they became. Right. Um and it, we absolutely see the same things for the Radix engine. The Radix engine is essentially giving assets as a concept for free to developers. Now you now now you do, or finance as a concept for free to developers. You still have a load of things that you want to define what you want to happen within a financial system. Right. But the system itself is is there as a definable property of uh, of of what you want to create. So building DeFi is now a question of like what's the what's the functionality you want, mm -hmm. not. Well, let's start by defining what we mean by an asset or what we mean by a transfer or what we mean by a atomic swap or something like that. All of that is just given by the Radix engine. And we we see that as being just the most powerful possible thing we can give to the decentralized finance ecosystem at this stage. Yeah, I mean, we've been amazed by how much that you know, I, I say one feature. There's actually quite a bit of complexity to it. But like, if you can, if you can provide that asset, that if if you can make the platform asset oriented in that way, that right. that assets, like the, that, the entire notion of how the platform functions is built around assets. We've been actually even surprised ourselves at just how much this simplifies the problem for developers in the end, and how much more clear the code ends up in the end. It's like it's not even really about the the programming language that you use. It's about what the, the features you have access to through that programming language. And so this is why, you know, when, once we start showing examples of script code, this is, this is how you get to the fact that you can build Uniswap in, you know, a couple line, a couple screens of code rather than hundreds of lines of code of, of like, of, of, exquisitely optimized code on the, right. the slated side. Whereas to be honest, I mean like, you know, a, a something like Uniswap is one of our tutorials for script. It's like, it's that straightforward. Right. So, you know, before we get to the code itself, you really need to understand that like, it's like, okay, Scripto is based on Rust. It has some nice syntax. It's very flexible. But really the important thing is that Scripto, you, you will, when we start talking about Scripto, you'll see that it has these new functions that weren't part of Rust, that isn't part of any platform today. And those functions are going to be things like, you know, create token, put, take, move. You know, it's these, it's these core concepts of dealing with physical things. And the way we can, we can provide those special functions at the language level is that we have to build them in at the platform level. That has to be the language of Radix itself. And so that required a lot of, this is why we had to build in these notions from the beginning of architecting the platform, because you can't just retrofit it. Right. And this, and this, is, this is why we talk about Scripto being an asset-orientated or, or oriented programming language yes. because it, it it's it's not just the language it's the language plus the set of innate features that are given to it by the radix engine that means that 90 percent of the stuff that you would have previously have to worry about you just don't have to worry about anymore mm -hmm. and that is that is different from just implementing you know the evm in rust or or, right. or the evm or, or using wasm it's a fundamentally different approach that gives a huge amount of power to anyone who wants to build decentralized finance. And we think that's going to lead to incredible breakthroughs and incredible complexity. They're just not possible with the EVM because the EVM punishes complexity so highly. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so this is why we, you know, strategically made the decision that, you know, we often get the question of like, well, you know, why, why can't you guys just drop the EVM on your platform and focus on scalability? It's like, well, I mean, for one, we just don't think it's good enough. We think that there's no way you're going to get to the level of complexity that DeFi, and the level of complexity and the level of safety that you need from DeFi to really start taking over the world with this development model. We had to go back and, and come up with something that was more purpose-built for that. And then on top of that, 
once you've made that decision to architect the platform to make that possible, EVM doesn't really make sense anymore. Like we, we can't just drop EVM on top of our platform because, you know, we've architected the platform for a better way of doing it. So, you know, there is, there is going to be a little bit of a learning curve with crypto. We'll get into this. It's like, it's a different way of thinking about things, but what we've been finding in, we've been doing some testing with early developers around this, about like this, this Radix engine philosophy of doing things, you know, they typically come in and go like, all right, how do I build an ERC-20 in this? Like, well, actually you don't. You don't have to. And here's how you do it. Like, well, how would I build this thing? Well, well, actually, you think about it a little bit different way. They kind of go, oh, huh, that's interesting. And then when they get to the end of the tutorial, they go, ooh, that's way better. Right. Um, and and the co- so the cool thing is like, you know, you can kind of think of this little speed bump at the beginning of the learning curve. It's your, you have to get up to something, thinking about things in terms of assets. But once you've made that mental shift, everything else after that gets just orders of magnitude easier. And so right. this is this has been the source of the enthusiasm we've been getting from developers who've been looking at it. Awesome. And in the next video, we're going to start talking about Scripto itself. Yes. Um, but it's been such a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much um, for your time, Matt. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the next one. Absolutely. Talk to you next time.